Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm currently trying to analyze where we are in terms of the pandemic. We have a very strange situation where the pandemic has been declared over, but yet we are still having raging cases across the world. The critical question is, what does it mean? And sadly, because we haven't done adequate research, and for me, adequate research would have to include histopathology with autopsy analysis of deaths to try and understand exactly what is happening. I'm going to be sharing some thoughts that I think are relevant to what may be happening now and why it could be relevant for the future. So I'll be looking at this paper, Neutralization Escape by SARS-CoV-2, Omicron subvariant BA 2.86. And this here was, we have a publication date, the 13th of November. I think it's been out for a little bit more than that time, um, but this is the date on it. So we'll come back to that paper in just a few minutes. And I'll, just, I'll well be sharing some thoughts about IgG4. Um, and just an explanation about it as well as we look at what could be happening in the context of the pandemic. Additionally, I plan to look at some data from Finland to try and understand what's happening in a place where they are actually measuring and looking at cases. So before I start, just a reminder for anyone who is interested, coming up quite shortly, diabetes, COVID and vaccines, why autoimmunity is so critical. I think this is a very, very important topic because I anticipate that diabetes is going to become, it was already a global epidemic. I think that it will be accelerated in the context of the pandemic and then just looking at some of the reasons around it. So getting back to this immune storm about COVID-19, we are currently in very complex times. We have a situation where from a political and from a, a corporate point of view, many people would prefer for the past to just be behind us and we move forward. Our problem is, is that we still have circulating virus. And once that is occurring, we then have to question what are the longer term implications. That's really all I've been saying from the start. Don't just assume, let's look, let's study, let's try and anticipate in whatever way we can what could be coming next. So let's get back to the point about the paper here. So I'm going to share with you this uh, neutralization escape. And what they were looking at here is they were anticipating this new variant, BA 2.86, being able to spread because it had evaded in terms of its um, its uh, in terms of the changes on the uh, on the virus spike protein. It had over thirty mutations on that spike compared to BA two and XBB 1.5. and so they were worried that it might evade neutralizing antibodies induced by vaccination or infection. And so they were comparing it to the other variants that were out there at the time. I'll, I'll show you uh, a bit more detail here about what exactly is happening across the world with regards to the, to the variants and the spread of variants, because it highlights that we've got a real problem. So this is looking at the global transitions of the different variants that you have. And here you see, this is looking from April 1st all the way through to September 30th. So this is over about a, a six month period here. And uh, this was in 2023. And you can see that uh, this red variant was XBB15, and that has gradually been decreasing. Uh, this one that has remained relatively consistent, uh, this light blue one is XBB116. Um, this one here that has been expanding significantly across the world, uh, 
Uh, this purple one here is the, I think when I look at the slide, it's the EG 5.1. And at the very top here, which you can barely see, is a slight blue mark for the BA286, right at the very top here. So it was only just starting to evolve, and they were concerned about it because of the the transitions of um, of this variant. So these are important things. And when you look at the emerging variants across different parts of the world here, you can see the countries where the emerging variants are most commonly sampled. This was in China. They primarily have EG 5.1. Australia similarly has EG 5.1. Sweden as well. So across the world, EG 5.1 is the main the main variant, except probably for South Africa. And you can see here in South Africa, the BA 2.86 seems to have taken a bit of a surge. So this is something that we're seeing happening across the world. It's important to acknowledge for those who were stating that this was being driven by the unvaccinated cohorts. I think it's very clear now that that probably was not accurate science. And this is where the politics and the science get compounded and it causes for lots of problems, as we have said before. What I want to do now is highlight what exactly they saw with regards to looking at BA286 and the impact that this would have against uh, antibodies. So here they had a cohort of people. This was not a, a large cohort of people. And they were looking at whether or not first, this line is if they took the bivalent booster at the time, and this was if they didn't. So these are people who have been vaccinated and boosted. This is now the most recent bivalent booster um, that has um, has come out, which is a combination of the Omicron and the the original um, original original virus uh, or spike protein. And when we look across here, in terms of the bivalent booster, you have here. This is the WA twenty twenty. So this is the original variant, and at this end here is the BA two point eight six. And they're doing this across all of the periods. In this, this is the baseline. This is at month six with no infection, and this is at month six with infection. And in case, just to make sure you can see the numbers here, so at baseline here um, with the booster, it was about 16,172. The highest response from an antibody point of view, this is what caught my attention, was still the original virus, even though we have all these variants. And you can see down here, they've gone through all the variants, BA125, XBB, and finally you have BA2.86. So even though this is a more recent variant, or even the XB16 down here, the Omicron variants have a weaker response after boosting than the original. And this was part of the concern that I would have had where you have this immune imprinting, where even though you are facing a different kind of virus, your primary response is still to the original virus. And you can see here that at month six with no infection, this has come down a bit to 10,000. And you see this gradual fall across these um, antibody levels. When it comes to month six with infection, this number jumped to 35,000 from 16,000. That's almost double. And what they were happy about, I guess, was the fact that BA 2.86 went from 304 um, to here. It went to 979. And this, is, uh, this was what they wanted. But again, you can see there is a huge difference in terms of the response to the uh, original variant. And this is what we call immune imprinting. Now, one important part of that question that hasn't been adequately answered, because they were looking to see whether or not the antibody neutralizes the virus, so they infect cells with it to look at it. But here is the question that has been missed over and over again. It's just been talked about from the scientific community. 
but the relevance of it we haven't fully understood. And this is to do with the IgG response. Now, what they had looked at before was, lo was looking at total IgG. But here is an important study that showed that when it came to infection after this is post-second dose, post-third dose of uh, vaccines, what they found here with IgG4 was a huge jump, a 38 times jump with IgG4 levels. So IgG1 stayed stable. There is some increase with IgG2. IgG3 actually decreased. Now, 1 and 3 are the ones that tend to trigger the immune system. IgG4 tends to be the one that is immune tolerant. It tells your immune system not to respond. And this one jumped 38 times. Actually, when we look at, this is an example of our antibody profile. You can see here IgM, IgD, IgG, IgA, and IgE. This is the one that responds usually first to an infection. And IgG is the one that is usually long-term infection response. But IgG can be broken down into four different categories. IgG 1, 2, 3, 4. The 1 and 3 are the main ones that usually trigger the immune system to respond to a foreign virus or bacteria. IgG2, we're not quite sure about. It doesn't tend to be so much relevant at the moment. But IgG4 is the one that triggers tolerance. So it helps your immune system to not respond to what it thinks is no longer a problem. Like what I said, beekeepers get when they're continuously stung by bees. They tend to have high IgG4. So this is what we're worried about is causing the immune system to not respond as well when it's faced with infection. And that could explain why we see such high circulation of virus in regions that have high vaccination levels. So these are important things that we have to understand. I think that why I'm concerned is that if we don't fully understand the immune mechanisms that are occurring, how do we know that even mild infection should not be taken seriously? Because in many countries, there is no concern about the spread of infection as long as it's not severe COVID-19. But suppose it still is relevant. Suppose it still makes patients die, but just not in the same way. Is that not a problem? Is it that patients blocking ICUs is a problem rather than the fact that they die? This is an important question that we have to answer in order to, to be clear. Now, I also want to highlight one more part of the interesting puzzle. And this is data from Finland. I'd seen a, a news um, article from Thailand Medical News that caught my attention. And they were looking at here the number of cases with regards to COVID-19. It starts all the way from 2020. And this is the bit that I was interested in here. Deaths temporarily related to coronavirus within 30 days. Okay. So within 30 days, what is actually happening? When you look at the period here, so this is the period here now. This is from September uh, 2023. You can see here that the cases are now starting to rise. In case you didn't notice, it, when, it, when we went down, this is all the way down into August and so on. You can see here that there are only 20s and 30s of cases, zero deaths, um, only a few deaths related one, three, four. But what's happening in Finland now that is causing concern is as you roll down into September, suddenly the cases are rising and also the number of deaths that are related within 30 days are rising. And you can see that this is now into October where it's starting to peak. So 216 cases, 18 deaths, 193 cases, 12 deaths. This is very significant because we're only now moving into the winter period. And you can see here, this is now the 25th of, um, of October 2023, peaks at about 341 cases, 10 deaths. And this is 30 days. So from there, we don't actually have the accurate numbers for this bit. But this is indicating that we are facing still a very significant phase in the pandemic. 
What we need answered is the interaction with IgG4. And this is the final image I'll show you here. And this one here is showing the different stages. And you have to remember IgG4 is primarily something that is an mRNA response. It doesn't happen so much with infection. It doesn't happen even with adenovirus uh, vector vaccines. It's primarily mRNA. And I do explain that at a different time. And this is originally where blue represents spike-specific IgG. And you can see in, in infection or even in the um, original just one dose, primarily it's IgG1 um, that is produced. But by the time you have this point here, no mRNA, but no infection, what you're seeing here is the IgG4 is occupying almost 45% of the immune response. This has got to be relevant, but we are unsure what that means in the context of infection and what I consider to be an immune storm that is raging within. So here is my final thought or my final concern. If we are facing a situation where even with asymptomatic or very mild infection, this is causing an immune storm that is not presenting as severe COVID-19 with respiratory illness, but can still lead to severe disease and death within a time frame of up to about three months, is that important? Do we need to know? Is it as long as the ICUs are not blocked, it's not important? These are important questions for us to answer. And as far as I'm concerned, they cannot be answered without adequate autopsy, adequate ability to understand exactly what is happening, especially from an immune perspective. So uh, these are my thoughts at the moment and expect that as these numbers continue to rise and the impact continues to hit, there will eventually be a response that may not be what you think it is. I think that this is going into a very scary time I think this winter could be quite challenging across the Northern Hemisphere. Let's hope for the best. But critically, if we don't have answers, we'll be unable to find mitigation solutions. Have a great evening.